Your body is amazing, but sometimes it needs fixing. All over the UK, there are special teams of professionals trained to tackle medical mysteries. The heart is the most important muscle in the body. Between beats, it relaxes and fills with blood, like I filled this tennis ball with water. And then when it contracts, it squeezes the blood out of it, forcing blood around your body. Now, just like squeezing the tennis ball, your heart pumping is hard work. And so to do exercise without getting out of breath, your heart has to be really strong. But not everyone has a tip-top heart. Every year, around 4,600 babies are born with a heart defect. This is 14-year-old Luke. He's one of those who's had heart problems since birth. So, Luke, tell me about the issues you've had with your heart. Well, Chris, I had four things wrong with my heart, and one of those was a hole in my heart. When your heart is working normally, it's incredibly powerful. Blood flows through its four chambers and is then pumped to every part of your body. But when you have a hole in the heart, there's a little opening between two of the chambers. This means blood doesn't flow as well as it should, and so less oxygen gets pumped around the body. What was the effect it had on your life? I was lacking in energy. Whilst I grew up, my friends got faster and stronger. I was staying the same, possibly getting weaker. Two years ago, Luke had major heart surgery, which allowed him to do more exercise. Oh made me fitter and stronger, so I've been able to get out there, do more things, and just enjoy myself. And now Luke is helping others by participating in research into how much exercise is safe for children with heart conditions. Dr Guido Pieles is running the research at Bristol University. Today, Luke is going to do some exercise under the close supervision of Dr Guido and his colleague Craig. This is the first time children's hearts have been monitored like this while they're exercising. Here we're looking right into Luke's heart, and then we see Luke's heart muscle, because after all, the heart is a muscle. Okay. And we can see this muscle contracting, relaxing at around 80 beats per minute. Luke also wears a mask so Dr Guido and his team can measure the amount of oxygen he uses. Feeling comfortable? Yep. Good. OK, so we've got a heart scanner, so we can take pictures of the heart. We've got the electrical trace of the heart, so we can look at the rhythm. And then we've got the oxygen mask on, so we can see how fit Luke is. Are you sweating yet? A little bit. <laughs> faint, faint drops of sweat. So your heart rate's now up at 115, so it's gone up quite a bit. Monitoring Luke's heart allows Dr Guido to see how well it's coping whilst exercising. There we've got Luke's heart again, and we can see that Luke's heart is contracting faster. Working much harder, but it's working well. As you can see, the ultrasound image on the left shows Luke's heart beating faster when he's exercising compared to the one on the right when he wasn't. And would you say he's safe to continue doing the kind of exercise he loves to do? Yes, because after all, exercise is good for our heart. It keeps us healthy and makes us live longer. If you have a heart condition, always check with your doctor before exercising. Although Dr Guido's research is only in its early stages, he's hoping to come up with some recommendations which will allow children with heart conditions to exercise safely like Luke. And now to our lab for some amazing body experiments. Ugh! Whoa! Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, it's your body's ticker, the heart. Zand is having a little lie down. You could actually try this bit at home. It's quite nice. But what you can't try at home is hooking Zand up to an electrocardiogram, which is what I've done. It's basically a heart monitor. And each one of these spikes on the display is a separate beat of the heart. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. Even if you're just lazing around like Zand, your heart never stops beating. It beats even when you're asleep. As Zand seems to be illustrating perfectly, you can see the spikes and his pulse is around 70. OK, Zond, demonstration over. What? What? What demonstration? I've been awake the whole time. Now, your heart was beating when you were a six-week-old embryo inside your mum, just the size of a raisin. Your heart is made up of millions of tiny cells, and each one of those cells beats on its own. And here's one of them. This is a single heart cell. It just won't stop beating, even without its mates. Absolutely brilliant, isn't it, Zond? Zond? Zand! What? It's not nap time. Now, if you ask more of your body, say when you exercise... Exercise? Yes, Zand, exercise. Your heart will step up and help you out. Right, give me some nice big star jumps, please, Zand. 
When you exercise, your muscles need lots more blood and oxygen. To provide this, the heart speeds up. As you can see, Zahn's heart rate is much higher now than when he was lying down. Even at rest, it beats around 100,000 times a day. So, you've seen how your heart beats at different rates depending on what you're doing. But how does your heart actually work? How does it get all that blood where you need it, when you need it? Well, we're going to show you. Check this out. This is a real heart. It's from a pig, but don't let that put you off. It's very similar to a human heart, and it's a pump with no equal. Blood arrives in the heart all tired and out of oxygen. The heart pumps it straight to the lungs, where it collects new oxygen. Back at the heart, it's given a mega pump, which scoots it all around the body. And there's no chance of it going the wrong way, thanks to the heart's special valves. And if you add up all the blood each of these beats pushes around the body, it comes to 7,200 litres a day. That's enough to fill 93 bathtubs. We've only got one bathtub. And if you fill it with blood, where am I going to have my bath? You need a bath. Now, to show you how it manages to do that, we're going to cut our pig's heart open. Looking inside the heart is absolutely amazing. The muscle here is very thick. This makes the heart really strong, and that's how it's able to pump blood right around your body. But it couldn't do it without one important bit of the heart, the valves, and you can see them here. Their job is to make sure the blood goes in the right direction. To see how the heart does its incredible job, we've set up our real heart, using plastic tubes as blood vessels and green water to do the job of your blood. OK, Chris, lift your bucket up a little bit. First, the heart fills with blood. It does this every time it beats. Oh, look, look at that. Look at it fill, look at it fill. OK, and squeeze now. Zahn's hands are doing what the heart does by itself thousands of times a day. And the heart is clever because everything's going into that bucket and nothing's going back into Chris's bucket. The heart only pumps blood in one direction. And that's thanks to the valves, not to Harry Styles. But there's one question that still remains. How powerful is the heart and how far can it squirt blood? I filled the heart. Now, you hold that bit, I'm going to get the bucket. Give me that. Quick, quick, quick. Get the bucket. OK. See okay. if you can get it. About a foot? Yeah, about half a metre. Go. OK, go. Yeah! It's not bad, but I think we can go further. Let's refill the heart. OK, quick, fill it up again. But Zahn's squeeze is not nearly as strong as a heartbeat. Just aim it all in the bucket. Ready? OK, three, two, one. <laughs> Zahn gets quite a lot beyond the bucket. He just didn't get any in the bucket, but I still think that's pretty impressive. About two and a half metres. Two and a half metres is pretty good, but a live heart actually beats powerfully enough to squirt blood more than 10 metres. 10 metres? That's more powerful than my best water pistol. Luckily, Zahn's not 10 metres away. Come on, temperature, temperature. I need my temperature. Zahn, what are you doing? I'm trying to get this little car to take my temperature. I can see that, but why? Haven't you heard? There's this whole new system. Patients are using Formula One car technology to monitor their vital signs. Yes, Zahn, I have heard of this. And it is true, patients are getting their vital signs monitored by Formula One race car technology, but this is obviously not how it works. You're right! I need a real car. Sounds like a case for investigation, ouch. It seems totally bizarre that taking a patient's vital signs could be helped by a car. So I'm heading off in the fast lane to meet the motors. And I'm starting with a pit stop on the wards to meet Matt, who's just had a heart operation. You've got a lot of different monitoring going on here at the moment. Can we see how many wires are on your chest? Matt is wired up to a monitor to check his vital signs. Vital signs are important bits of information about a patient, such as oxygen levels and heart rate. Are you allowed to unplug yourself at all? What I have to do is I have to get my nurse. They uh, will take this off. Doctors and nurses write down Matt's vitals by hand on a chart. This system's time-consuming for the staff and, more importantly, uncomfortable for Matt. So, at the moment, for you, basically, leaving the bed is a real hassle. Yeah. Chris, this is where the cars come in. 
In Formula One, monitoring systems have gone up a gear. This is Dr. Adam Hill. He's the chief medical officer at McLaren and works out how Formula One technology can be used in hospitals. What a cool job. So how much is a Formula One car like a human being? Well, Formula One cars are incredibly complex devices. They have an engine, a bit like our heart. They have a need to breathe, a bit like our lungs. And they're incredibly intelligent. Oh, just like me. And the healthier the car, the faster it goes. So just like a patient, its vital signs are monitored. We use little gadgets like this that collect information at up to 960,000 times every single second from a single sensor. Wow, that is amazing. The F1 system is wireless, efficient and fast. If only the hospital had something like this. Well, Dr Adam has worked with Birmingham Children's Hospital to create a new system. It's a world first. It's brand new and I'm going to try it out. Alex, that, that's yes, it now. That's it now. It's flashing. It's flashing. It's, it's sending the signal to the monitor. Yeah. It has one sensor doing the same job as the six that Matt is hooked up to. The results are instantly available on the computer monitor. Bye-bye charts. <laughs> Plus, it's wireless. I can walk anywhere, even do a few press-ups if I like. You're doing very well, Chris. All this time, it's recording my vital signs. Perfect. And then I can download my results when I get back. Even though I was jumping at the other end of the hospital, the computer knows what I've been up to. Well, the hope is that children will be able to go home with this system and they will be able to take one of these tablets with them so we can log on from the hospital and see what's happening in their, ha in their homes. This would be life-changing for patients like Matt. How much easier would you find it if you could just wear that new monitor? A lot. Seriously, I would lose a lot of these wires. It's small, compact, and that monitor takes 60 seconds to uh, monitor your heart. The other one monitors it every second. And I think it'll be great for the future. Okay. And then hopefully other kids uh, will find it a lot easier in hospital. Thanks, Matt. Who would have thought that hospitals can learn stuff from a car? <laughs> Do you know what happens to your body when you go on a roller coaster? <laughs> exactly what I was looking for. This is a case for investigation. Ouch. Being scared, you might love it or you might hate it, but whichever it is, big changes happen with your body. And I'm going to show you what those changes are by riding one of Britain's scariest roller coasters. <laughs> Roller coasters are exciting. Sometimes we scream, sometimes we puke. So why do we keep going on them? We've evolved over millions of years to either fight dangerous things or run away from them. And it's the reward that our brain gives us when we survive something that feels dangerous that keeps us coming back for more. I'm taking on a terrifying ride at Alton Towers to see how my body deals with fear. So I'm going to be wearing this sensor, which is going to be measuring my heart rate, my heart rhythm, my breathing rate, loads of different stuff that is going to be telling me what's happening with my body and measuring essentially how frightened I am. OK, that's my heart rate there. At the moment, it's a normal resting heartbeat. Keep an eye on it. Let's see what happens when I take on this scary ride. Now. Very quickly, my body has started to feel fear. And when you're scared, your heart rate rises. Look at my beats per minute. They're going up rapidly. That's because my body has started to release adrenaline, a hormone that prepares you to deal with a dangerous situation. Adrenaline comes from the adrenal glands at the top of your kidneys. It tells your liver to release more glucose to your muscles, to give them energy, and make sure you're charged up and ready to face your fear. Terrifying. My heart rate's very high, but as I finish the ride, it goes up even further. Let's find out why. So as the ride starts, my heart rate remains fairly flat because I basically don't think the roller coasters are all that frightening. But the ride is so cleverly designed that I become completely convinced my legs are going to be chopped off and I'm definitely going to die. That's when my heart rate almost doubles and I'm totally terrified. 
My body is responding in exactly the same way it would if I was being attacked, and that is the fear response. But here's the thing. At the end of the ride, this point here, my heart rate goes up another 10 beats, and that's because I'm so happy I survived the dangerous situation. That's the reason we love these scary rides, because once you've survived it, you get that feeling of extreme happiness and a spike of adrenaline, and that's what makes your heart go faster at the end. So what happens to your body when you go through the same scary experience a second time? I'm gonna go on the ride again. So with frightening situations, you can either make it worse and get more frightened every time it happens, or you can learn that actually nothing bad's gonna to happen to me on a roller coaster. I didn't die last time, so this time I'm gonna control my fear and be less frightened. This is the beginning bit where my heart rate previously was very normal, and this time it is a bit exciting. On this second ride, my heart rate isn't jumping up as quickly as the first ride. And that's because I know what to expect, and therefore, my fear response is not as dramatic. Now I've learned that nothing bad happens, I can really control that fear all the way through it. And you can do that with exams, you can do that with films, you can do it with anything you find frightening. You can just realise that actually very few things are really dangerous and you can stop being frightened. If you're not frightened, you can keep your head together. So during the second ride, my heart rate only goes up to 112 during the most exciting bit of the ride. And at the end of the ride, I don't get that extra bump in heart rate. And I didn't feel that amazing euphoric sense of I've survived something really dangerous. And that's the thing I'm now craving. Luckily, there are loads more rides. Ouch. Time to catch up with the next ouch patient. Bolu has a condition called sickle cell anemia. This is where the body produces unusually shaped red blood cells, which aren't very good at carrying oxygen. And this causes problems such as blood clots, tiredness and pain. When they go through your veins, they get stuck, they get stuck together, and then when they get stuck together inside your veins, that's normally where the pain is. And if it's not treated soon and quickly, it could escalate and cause a crisis. A crisis is when Bolu is in too much pain to cope at home and has to go to hospital. With my condition, I can go into hospital nearly two times a month. To try and prevent a crisis, Bolu has a special piece of kit to help her with the pain she gets. It's called a TENS machine. When I have pain, the, the signals from my leg goes up to my brain and my brain is starting to coordinate with that and tell my legs you have pain. Then that's when I start to know I have pain. But then this, it gives it a different signal. So my brain is listening to this signal more than this signal. So I won't really feel the pain as much as I normally do. But sometimes things get too much and Bolu has to be admitted to hospital. My leg is hit a bit. I'm just going to like use my medication and do what I need to do to make it go away. As Bolu begins feeling better, she joins in her favourite hospital activity. But I'm doing music today with... Georgina. Hello. <laughs> Who? Hi. And Daisy. It's going to be good. <laughs> Great tunes, Bolu. We hope you're feeling better soon, and we'll catch up with you next time. Bye. Blood. If you're sick and you need it, nothing else will do. The tricky bit is, there's only one way of getting hold of blood, taking it out of people. People like me. Around 4,000 litres of blood are used in hospitals all over England every day. It's vital for life-saving treatments and that's why donations are so important. I'm just about to insert a needle into your arm, Zond. Yeah, so that's in and actually it really didn't hurt at all. You feel a bit of a scratch and it's not a very nice idea, but Linda's a real expert, so it's, it's completely fine. And you're doing really well there, all up and going. There it is, filling up. Now, your body is actually a blood factory. It's constantly making new blood. But it makes it in a place you might not expect, in the middle of your bones. In fact, our bodies can produce two million red blood cells every second. That's incredible. I'm donating about half a litre of blood, the equivalent of almost two cans of fizzy drink. That's around 13% of the blood circulating around my body. Now, you can't give blood until you're 17, but you can receive it, and it could save your life. That's me done, and it only took five minutes. I'm going to come out now, OK? Well done. Just keep pressure on there for us, OK? That's lovely. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. This is a bag of my blood, 
and sometime in the next 35 days, it's going to be put inside someone else, possibly saving their life. But it can't go straight into them. First, it's got to go to the blood factory. This is the largest blood factory in the world, and we're going in. I've never seen anything like this. Behind me are 800 bags of live human blood. Wah! And John Kirkwood is here to tell me what's going to happen to my blood. Your blood will be one of 3,000 donations that we'll have taken from donors. So we're talking about a small swimming pool full of we blood are. Yeah, we every are. day every coming day. in here. Yes. All the blood coming into the factory first gets put onto a giant rack where it's filtered to remove some of the cells which can't be used by every patient. What happens next? Well, then we take the pack round to what we call a manufacturing pod and then we will take out the plasma and the platelets and the red cells. The factory's job is to process and sort our blood into three main products which treat patients with different medical needs. The first product is red blood cells, which are often used for operations and transfusions. Then there are plasma and platelets. The darker liquid, plasma, contains proteins and cells to help patients fight diseases. Finally, platelets are tiny but important. They help blood clot and can be used for specialist bone marrow and cancer treatments. To split up the red blood cells from the plasma and platelets, the blood is put into here. It acts just like a big washing machine and spins around really fast, causing different cells to separate into three layers. Then a big press squeezes out the plasma and platelets, so you end up with them in bags up here and the red blood cells at the bottom. In a different part of the factory, a vital step in the processing is taking place, testing. Every unit of blood that's donated has to be tested for two reasons. First, blood can carry diseases, and you really don't want to catch a disease from a blood transfusion. The second reason your blood needs to be tested is that just like people have different colour eyes or different colour hair, people actually have different kinds of blood. This is called blood groups, and you may have heard of them. There's A, there's B, there's AB, there's O. Now, if you get given the wrong kind of blood, this could be fatal. But don't worry, these guys are very good at what they do. These are the final products of this massive blood factory. Thousands of bags of living human blood, including mine, all going out to save lives. Because thousands of litres of blood are being used every day in the UK, it's vital that blood donations keep coming into the factory to be processed, ready to use in our hospitals.